In the last iteration, you watched me attempt to convert this go-kart to electric for our child's sixth birthday using a used car alternator as a motor, a couple of Ryobi battery packs as a power source, and a cheapo 1500 watt motor controller as a, well, a motor controller. But ultimately, I failed. It doesn't work. That was obviously no good at all. So this time, instead of going cheap and easy, I'm going whole hog. I've bought all new components for this thing, and I'm gonna do this conversion properly. So will I succeed this time? I don't know, hopefully. And here are all of my new components. Batteries, BMS, charger, motor controller, DC to DC converters, and lastly, a contactor. I'm gonna start with the battery pack. This is a box of 120 lithium iron phosphate cells, each with a capacity of 12.16 watt hours. Now to make a containment device for these cells, I'm gonna be employing my Stepcraft CNC router. And after a bit of cleanup, I'm left with these four parts right here. I made these out of black acrylic because I happen to have some lying around that I got for free. If I didn't have acrylic, I probably would have used plywood or something. And here's the result of all that work. It's a box for batteries. On one end, I CNC carved these slots into it for air ventilation. On the other end, I CNC carved these slots in a circular pattern, again for air ventilation, but it's in a circular pattern because I bought a small computer fan to fit in here to circulate air over the batteries. On the underside of the lid, I routed these grooves for holding the battery modules in place. And there's a complementary set of grooves in the bottom of the box so that when the lid is screwed down in place, the battery modules will be clamped between the top and the bottom of the box and not go anywhere. And to finish off the outside of the box, I used this aluminum finish spray paint. And for reasons unknown to me, I hid the box joints in the corners by filling in all the gaps and voids with CA glue, sanding it down, and then spray painting over top of that. So that's all well and good, but I don't like this box. And I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's the crappy aluminum finish spray paint that I used to cover the outside of it. Maybe it's the fact that I tried to make a wood box look like a not wood box with dubious results. Maybe it's just the fact that I used plywood to make a battery box. I'm not really sure why I don't like it, but I don't. I'm not happy with this box and I'm just not vibing with it. So I made this one instead and I may have gone a wee bit overboard. Instead of wood, I made this frame out of one inch square steel tubing and it's all welded together. These tubes are bristling with these little steel tabs which were quite labor intensive to make. Bolted the tabs on the sides of the box is just a piece of thin clear acrylic. On one end of the box is another piece of clear acrylic but this time with some hexagonal air vent holes CNC routed into it. And on the other end, I cut some more air vent holes but this time in a five spoke circular pattern with a computer fan mounted right behind it to blow out, suck air out of the box and across the batteries for cooling. The bottom of the box, this thing is so heavy now, <laughs> is just a piece of plywood that's bolted to those tabs underneath. But I did coat that piece of plywood in some spray on rubberized underbody coating for cars to give it a nice rubberized textured finish. And the top of the box is a slightly thicker piece of acrylic that's attached to the top with bolts going into rib nuts into these tabs. And I even took the extra time to V-car some silly warnings into the top of it. I like this new box significantly better than the last box. Although this one's a bit closer to a display case than a battery box. Regardless, I like it. Now, battery connections. All of these individual cells needed to be connected together. Otherwise they're useless. 
If you look up online whether or not you can solder directly to the ends of battery cells like this, you'll get a bunch of people that all say, no, it's a terrible idea. Soldering means sustained heat. You'll damage all of your battery cells, and what's worse is your entire family will be cursed forever. All of your children will be born naked. Another common way to connect cells together is by spot welding little nickel tabs like this one here between the ends of the batteries. Unfortunately, I don't have a spot welder. So I made one! This is also overcomplicated and excessive. If you want to see how I made this spot welder, there's a video about it on my second channel. Since I made that video, I've actually upgraded the cable a little bit to welding cable, so it's a lot more flexible than it was when it started out. Tim Tam, Cashies, Hungry Jacks, Didgeridoo, Mighty Car Mods, Holden, Adelaide, Perth. That's not a knife. What are you doing? Isn't it obvious? Vegemite, definitely not. I'm trying to make my computer think I'm Australian. Local celebrity dank pods. What? Why do you sound so confused? Oh, this won't work. Of course that's not going to work. Any idiot would. What are you doing now? Directions to Bunnings. You're right, it won't work unless I hold my laptop upside down so it thinks it's on the other side of the planet. Okay, let's just accept this. Why are you trying to make your laptop think you're Australian? Man, respect to Australians. It's really hard to read upside down. And I'm trying to watch Rick and Morty. That doesn't track. And flip your laptop around, you massive idiot. What doesn't track? I'm trying to watch Rick and Morty. I heard if you live in Australia, you can watch the latest season of Rick and Morty on Netflix right now. Okay, so you're trying to make your computer think you're Australian by shouting stereotypes at it in the hopes that Netflix will let you watch the latest season of Rick and Morty. Yeah, see, you get it. Yeah, that's incredibly stupid. Wow, that's hostile. Well, if you're so smart, how would you go about it, huh? That's easy, I'd use nordvpn.com slash agingwheels. That's over my head. No, it's not. No, literally. Oh. Anyway, NordVPN is a virtual private network. Route all your internet traffic through one of their thousands of servers in 59 different countries, including Australia. So I can just connect to a NordVPN server in Australia and watch Rick and Morty? Yes, and you won't have to do whatever that was. Won't that be slow? No, Nord servers are surprisingly fast, and as an added bonus, Nord doesn't keep any logs, and all of your internet traffic will be encrypted. So I don't have to pretend to be Australian? No. And please never do again. Well, what if I want German Netflix? Please tell me you weren't planning to act German next. Nine. They have servers in Germany, too. What'd you say? Get a two-year plan of NordVPN at a huge discount, plus four months free when you go to nordvpn.com slash agingwheels. Okay, you don't have to yell at me, but what if I don't like it? Easy, they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, I'll get it right now. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Go to nordvpn.com slash agingwheels. Perfect. I've got a problem. Right after the last shot you just saw, I got sick. My voice hasn't fully recovered yet, and I lost an entire week of work. Oh, and my homemade spot welder isn't going to work for the series connections on these batteries. As you can see, I've already spot welded all this nickel stripping down for all the parallel connections. I should explain that. When battery cells are connected together in series, the voltage of the cells gets added together towards the output. When they're connected in parallel, the voltage stays the same, but it's the amperage that gets added together. More specifically, the amperage capacity of the cells. I'm configuring my battery pack to the 5P24S configuration, which means 5 in parallel, 24 in series, as seen here in this diagram. Since each one of my lithium iron phosphate cells is rated at 3.2 volts nominal, that means added together in the 24 series configuration gives me a 72 volt battery pack. Yes, I know, 3.2 times 24 is actually 76.8, but this is the standard configuration for a 72 volt lithium iron phosphate battery pack, so I'm not going to question it. Anyway, as I was saying, I've already made all the parallel connections with these strips of nickel spot welded in place on the ends of the cells. Unfortunately, nickel is a fairly resistive metal, and all of these little strips can only handle 2 amps of current each. Since I'm building my battery pack to withstand 100 amps continuous, this nickel stripping will not be sufficient for the series connections of this battery pack. I knew this ahead of time, which is why I got this stuff. This is nickel-plated copper stripping. Copper is far more conductive, which means it can handle far more current than the equivalent size of nickel. But by itself, copper is not spot weldable, at least not easily. So that's why this stuff is nickel-plated, to theoretically make it more spot weldable. Unfortunately, my homemade spot welder 
is it powerful enough? Because copper is so much more conductive than nickel, it takes a much higher power of spot welder to spot weld this stripping into place. And my spot welder didn't cut it. So to try to fix this, I tried several different things. First, I connected my homemade spot welder to 240 volts instead of 120 volts. And this worked brilliantly. It spot welded perfectly until the transformer started melting. Uh. <coughs> Then I bought an off-the-shelf traditional 240 volt spot welder and connected my pin here directly to the outputs of that, which didn't work at all. I even tried soldering the tabs directly to the ends of the cells, which I said was a bad idea and still is. I tried to give myself a fighting chance by using this giant 200 watt soldering gun, but it still took too long. Throughout all this testing, I'm pretty sure I heat damaged several of these cells, so I bought some replacements just to be on the safe side. So if I can't spot weld the series connections and I can't spot weld them, how am I gonna make the series connections of this battery pack? Like this. <laughs> That's right, I'm using clamp-on copper bus bars like this, and I spent the better part of a day making 110 of these things, but they're not going to work as I intended. Let me explain to you the problem. How I had planned to clamp these things down was with a screw. That's why each one of them has a hole in it. So I drilled and directly tapped threads into the acrylic space between the battery cells, and then drove a little tiny number eight screw to hold the clamp down in place. And that worked great in my testing. But I was worried since I was using metal screws that I risk accidentally short circuiting the battery. All that screw had to do was slightly abrade the casing on one of the batteries, and then it would short circuit. So I ordered 200 number eight screws, this time made of black nylon, but these didn't work because the nylon is too soft, the acrylic just ripped the threads to pieces, and they didn't have any clamping power whatsoever. So I went ahead and plugged on anyway with these little metal screws because the nylon screws were too weak, and that's when I found out the threads that I cut into the acrylic were too weak, and half of the screws that I drove in just stripped straight out. So at this point, I was real frustrated because it seems like this project is just one problem after another, and I keep having these stumbling blocks, and I'm only on the first step. I haven't even got past the battery pack yet. So I stepped away from it for a day, and finally figured out how I'm gonna clamp down these little bus bars by using the magic and wizardry that is 3D printing. I went into Fusion 360 and modeled this sort of bar clamp that would hold all of the bus bars in place and then clamp them down using the bolts that are already clamping the casing together. I printed one out and it worked perfectly. So I went back and printed like a whole lot more. These are made out of PETG, by the way. And this is how I'm going to clamp all of these bus bars in place. Done. To get to this point, I had to rip apart these battery modules, which unfortunately meant ripping up all of my pretty spot welds, so I could take these acrylic casement pieces back over to the CNC router to route new bolt holes in them. Once that was done, I could reassemble these battery modules, re-spot weld all the parallel connections. This time I used slightly thicker 0.15 by 8 millimeter nickel strip. Then I spot welded on these little hole punch nickel strip offshoots to give a place to attach the balance leads of the BMS. Then I clamped down all these series connection bus bars using these clamps that I printed out. These modules are now almost completely done. All I have left to do is make end of pack connectors like this one here that I've prototyped. Now these battery modules are completely done, complete with end connectors and everything. And yes, I did use some more 3D printed parts. I'm liking 3D printing. Anyway, there's a problem with these modules. They fit in the battery box. 
but there's no way to physically get them in there. The tabs that hold the lid in place interfere and I can't slide these two modules past one another to get them both in the battery box at the same time. So last night off camera, I took a hacksaw to this thing, cut off all of those tabs, ground flushed the welds, and then touch it painted where those tabs used to be. Now there's a big open gap at the top of this display case slash battery box, and I can fit both of these modules in there at the same time. I'll have to make a new lid for this box, but that's a problem for later. Now it's BMS time. This is the Dally BMS I purchased for this project. This one is rated for a 72 volt lithium iron phosphate battery pack in the 24S configuration. The specific one is rated for 100 amps continuous, 300 amps peak. The job of a BMS, or battery management system, is to keep the cells in the battery pack from being overcharged or over discharged, and each one of these little balance wires goes to one unit in the series, in this case a unit being five cells in parallel, and keeps them all at the same voltage or balanced. Nothing on the go-kart will be directly connected to this battery pack. All of the power flowing into and out of these cells will flow through this BMS first, so this can do the job of protecting the cells. <laughs> Didn't mean to drop it. <laughs> if you're bothered by this mess of balance wires, don't worry, I am too. All right, now the moment of truth. Does it have some voltage? Yes siree, 79.1 volts. Needs a little bit of a charge. Motor controller. This is the no-name 1500 watt motor controller I used on the first attempt of this project. It's terrible, it's weak, it's unprogrammable, and it makes me sad. This is the motor controller I'll be using this go round. It's a Kelly controller, and I don't actually know what the power output rating of this thing is, because the Amazon listing I bought this thing through showed it as a 3000 watt motor controller. A fact which Kelly's website doesn't back up whatsoever, but what their website does say is the input power ratings. This thing is rated for 72 volts at 90 amps continuous of input power. If you multiply those two numbers together, you get 6,500 watts. So I don't actually know what the output power of this thing is, but regardless, it will be at least double this no-name piece of junk here, and more than the big stinky gas engine I took off the go-kart originally. And crucially, this controller is programmable via Bluetooth, no less. I've got all my components wired up and assembled on this test assembly, otherwise known as a board, and it works. Switch on the main contactor, and now in reverse, it works. The positive cable comes off the battery and goes into this battery cutoff switch, and then it goes into this 250 amp fuse, and then into the main contactor. A contactor, if you don't know, is essentially a giant relay big on-off switch, and that contactor is actuated by this little toggle switch right here. And bridging the contacts of the contactor is this pre-charge resistor. Motor controllers such as this one are packed full of capacitors. If I were to just straight up connect this motor controller to this battery pack, the spike of current rushing in to fill all of those capacitors all at once could be several hundred amps, enough to damage other components in this motor controller. To prevent that, there's a pre-charge resistor bridging the contacts of this contactor, so that even when this contactor is fully open and the circuit is not complete, there's still a small amount of current flowing through the circuit through this pre-charge resistor, enough to pre-charge the capacitors in the motor controller. Not enough to energize the motor controller, but enough to pre-charge the capacitors, so that when I actually close this contactor, the inrush current is much less and not enough to damage components in this controller. After leaving the contactor, the positive lead goes into the motor controller, where the electrons are shuffled around, and the direct current gets converted into three-phase alternating current to power my motor. Yes, I am still using this converted alternator as my motor. It's the only component I'm not changing with this iteration of the project. 
One of the reasons I didn't go with this controller in the first go round is because this controller does not work with sensorless motors. But in a desperate attempt to get this motor working the first time, I added Hall Effect sensors to the motor. So I inadvertently prepared it to work with this controller. So now it works great. My only concern with this alternator is that this motor controller might put out too much power for this alternator turn motor to handle. But the only way to find out if it'll work is to try it. And if it fails, it fails. I'll replace it with a proper motor. But let's try this and see if it works. Lastly, I have these two DC to DC converters that step the battery voltage down to 12 volts. And since there's two of them parallel together, it pushes out four amps. This 12 volts at four amps will be used to power the rotary and the alternator. And a little bit of this will be diverted to power the tiny computer fan in the battery box. And then throttle pedal. I think that's enough bench testing for now. Let's shove this all in the actual go-kart and see if it actually works. I'm gonna have to speed limit this thing. That's exciting. This is the point during the first time I tried this project that it all fell apart because I realized it could not get going on its own weight. <sighs> Let's try it. Okay. Oh, yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Let's back up now. Beep, beep. Beep. <laughs> it works. Wait, wait, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work again. Despite my initial enthusiasm about it being able to move forward two feet under its own power, I've once again failed this project. Before I tell you what's wrong with the go-kart, let me go over some finishing touches I made to the go-kart itself because I made some changes. I 3D printed this little box here to not only cover the bare terminals coming out of the top of the battery box, but also give it a place to mount the charging port. I printed this thing out of ABS and it didn't come out very well, but it does the job. I mounted the motor controller and this terminal box on these two pieces of aluminum that I made last time, but they were on the other side. I just moved them over to this side. And I made this little terminal box to house all the connections and everything out of wood that I painted yellow to match the battery box. And to top it off, I CNC routed this piece of clear acrylic so you can peer down inside of the box to see what's going on which right now is nothing. Initially, I bought a twist throttle and I was gonna adapt that to the existing throttle pedal on the go-kart somehow, but instead of doing that, I just bought this electronic throttle pedal and bolted it to the floor, like I should have done to begin with. The go-kart originally had a toggle switch mounted here that was a kill switch for the engine, so I used that bracket, welded on this piece of sheet steel to extend onto it, and then I replaced that original toggle with this one, which now controls the main contact or turns it on and off. I added this indicator light in the middle. It runs off the 12 volts from the DC to DC converters, just as some indication the go-kart is on, whether or not it's on. And this is a switch for reverse. And I bought this brake light switch here. This one happens to be from an Integra. And I was gonna hook it up to the brake pedal so that when you press the brake pedal, it cuts motor power. But I didn't get that far because I took it out for a test drive and found out the thing doesn't work properly. Okay, so what's wrong with it? It cuts out all the time. It cuts out so much that it is unusable. I can move forward, drive it forward, and even poodle around my driveway if I use 10, 20% throttle. But if I approach 50% throttle or go up a hill or put any sort of strain on that motor, it cuts right out. Uh... At first I thought, no big deal. I've upgraded from that magic black box of a controller to this programmable one. I can connect to it on my phone and see if it pops up any error messages or see what else is going wrong with it. So I did that, took it for a test drive with my phone connected, and every time it cut out, it popped up an error message that said, hall sensor error, which didn't help. That doesn't even make sense. I thought that maybe the voltage sag from the battery pack under load was messing with the DC to DC converters that are powering the rotor in the alternator. Maybe they're cutting out and that's manifesting as a hall sensor error because it's detecting something weird with the magnetic field in the rotor. So to test this out, I disconnected the rotor in the alternator from the DC to DC converters and instead powered that rotor with an 18 volt drill battery. And didn't really make much of a difference. It seemed to improve a little bit, but that may have just been me reading into it. Bottom line, it didn't work. Then I just started driving the go-kart around a little bit. I thought maybe I could just drive it around, poodle around my driveway, maybe I'll brainstorm ideas. And then the BMS started cutting out. I thought, no big deal, the battery's probably just low on charge, the BMS is cutting out, 
to prevent an over discharge situation. So I brought the go-kart inside, plugged it up to the charger, and then my charger died, this thing here. So I took this charger apart to see if I could find anything wrong with it, as you can see, because it's apart, and there's a little 10 amp fuse soldered onto the corner of the board. It was blown. So I clipped it off and went out and bought a replacement fuse, soldered that onto the board, and it blew immediately upon me plugging it back into the wall. So I ditched the fuse this time and just soldered on a straight up jumper wire, and that caused a dead short. It tripped the breaker of any outlet I plugged this thing into. So this charger is fried. I don't know what's wrong with it. So now I have to manually charge the battery pack with a DC power supply. So yeah, I failed in this go-kart a second time. Maybe the alternator as a motor isn't torquey enough for this application. Maybe I need reduction gears. Maybe I just need to use a higher torque load of motor. Maybe the alternator would have overheated anyway. I don't know the answer to any of these questions, and the hall sensor error that this motor controller is spitting out doesn't help at all. I think the next step with this project is to just buy a motor, one that didn't start out life as an alternator, but I'm not going to do that now or in the near future. I am so done with this project. I need to step away from it for a while, clear my head, work on other things. I will come back to this thing, don't worry about that but it's not gonna be any time relatively soon. I spent about a month and a half working on this project. Granted, about a week of that was me being sick, and I spent close to, if not over, $1,000 worth of parts. But despite those things, I don't consider this project a loss whatsoever, because I learned a heck of a lot working on this project. And I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out in terms of looks, because I spent time with the aesthetics. So the back end, the battery box, the control box, all that stuff, looks nice, which is good, because it doesn't work properly. And because I'm a YouTuber, even my failures are monetizable. I'm still getting a video out of this, so I'll be fine. But if you remember, I'm building this go-kart for our six-year-old, and he's gonna be fine too, but he's gonna be so disappointed. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for following along with me on this frustrating journey and special thanks to my Patreon supporters. Without whose help, I couldn't tackle projects like this and I sure as heck couldn't take a month and a half working on a project like this. A project that was so frustrating most of the time. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering why I don't put the gas engine back on the go-kart so a six-year-old can drive around the go-kart with the gas engine, it's because he doesn't like loud noises, and he wouldn't like to drive this thing very much with a loud sputtering gas engine behind his head. That's why. That's why I ditched the thing in the first place and started making this electric. Bye.